we are live. Oh, that's a lot to check. <laughs> well, hello everyone and welcome to the Fieldhouse Museum and our speaker event. My name is Nicole Meyer and I'm with the Fieldhouse Museum and I'm really, really pleased to welcome, welcome our guest speaker tonight, Rebecca Kaufman. She, so Rebecca is a third generation Stife enthusiast. Uh, her collection of button and ear treasures numbers north of 2000 and focuses on examples from 1905 to 1944, uncatalogued rarities, cloth dolls, and display animals. Through 2017, she was North, Stife's North American archivist where she identified and valued vintage items on behalf of the company. Today, Rebecca has no formal affiliation with Stife. Uh, Rebecca is also a contributor to Dolls, Doll News, Steph Club Magazine, Teddy Bear, Times and Friends, Worth Point, and Auction Daily. She has been invited to judge the Toby Teddy Bear of the Year Awards, as well as present at venues including the London International Antique Doll, Teddy Bear, and Toy Fair, the Christmas Cherubins Show, the United Federation of Dolls Clubs National Convention, the Doll Collectors of America Annual Meeting, the Virtual Doll Convention, Florida Doll Days, and the Ohio National Doll Show, among others. In 2014, through the Ju James D. Julia auctions, she evaluated and oversaw the lar largest and finest Stife teddy bear collection to come to auction in America. The 120 rarities on offer realized over $500,000. Rebecca's award-winning blog, My Stife Life, is updated weekly and focuses on vintage Stife finds, Stife antiquing, and travel adventures, international Stife happenings, and the legacy and history of the Stife company. It can be found on her website, www.mystifelife.com. Rebecca has consulted for HGTV, CBS, History.com, E! Entertainment, the BBC, and the radio program, The Antiques Air Show. Her auction house industry and media engagements have included Teddy Dorado, Christie's, Morphe Auctions, FAO Schwartz, the Boston Center for Adult Education, the Japanese Toy Foundation, the Strong National Museum of Play, the Questers, the Reading Society of Craftsmen, the Boston Globe, Bloomberg, Town and Country, the Huffington Post, and among others. We are really excited to have Rebecca here with us tonight. Uh, this presentation is in conjunction with our exhibit, Stife Everlasting, that is on display until January 3rd. So we're going into our last few weeks of it. And this display showcases the Zort collection of uh, Stife bears. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on over to Rebecca. Am I on now? Wonderful. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. I am contacting you live from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I call myself the uh, Stife Gal. I so appreciate your introduction. All of those things that you've listed make me feel very old, but that's okay because I have been doing Stife for many, many years, and I'm so excited to share with you the history of Stife's teddy bears. And what's so exciting about this fit is that the exhibit that is on display at the field house is wonderful items, I believe from maybe the 80s and 90s and forward. I'm gonna be talking mostly about items from the turn of last century. So which, which in turn were the ones that inspired the ones that are on display at the field house. So what you can see from what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is how these wonderful things came about. So I'm very excited to share that timeline and history with you. So what I'm going to do is I have a presentation for you. I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna pull up my presentation, hopefully, and not my tax returns. Okay, here we go. Nicole, is that is that uh, visible to everyone? I, I hope so. Well, wonderful. So what I'm going to do now is talk to you about my masterclass called Can You Bear It? It's a teddy bear masterclass. And what you see here on um, the left is a wonderful giant assortment of stife teddy bears. The smallest are amongst the smallest made. These are about 10 centimeters, which is about 
uh, three and a half or four inches. These bears that you see here are from the turn of last century till probably around 1970 or so. And this is the collection of bears that greet you at a museum in Switzerland called the Puppethouse Museum um, to introduce you to the Steiff collection. So this is something that I think about a lot and I thought would be a wonderful introduction to how beautiful not only these bears are, but how they look together. So let's dive right in. All right. So the history of Steiff goes back to about 1880 or so, but what I'm going to do is start right at the turn of last century and dive right into the teddy bear world. So in the beginning, Richard Steiff's grand idea. Now Richard Steiff, who you see here, who you see is very handsome with this wonderful mustache, is my secret dead boyfriend, and that's okay with my husband. He is a, was a wonderful and very creative person, and he invented many things. He was just an inventor at heart, but, he, but his, his aunt was Margareta Steiff, who started the Steiff Company, and Richard Steiff was the first of her nephews to join the company in 18, 1897. So Richard Steiff joined the company, and his job was to create wonderful and interesting products that would, be inter that would be perfect for the Steiff company to manufacture in terms of toys for children, as well as household items uh, for, for women to use around the home and in the kitchen. So what we have here is um, what the situation was in terms of, oops, sorry, I'm going back. What we have here is the status of really bears in the late 1890s. And what you see here is a series of, of bears that are made out of sort of a, a, a rough plush material. And you notice that each of the bears has on its nose a chain and it's kind of holding a post. Now, the reason for that is because these are what are called circus bears. And what you see or what you saw at the turn of last century was that circuses would come from town to town and uh, put on, uh, shows and such for the for the locals and circus bears uh, would be would be displayed like this with the chains around their nose and holding poles so they wouldn't escape so this is what people thought of as bears so these were what people created as bear toys and so what you see here on the far left you see a bear on a flat platform um, and underneath the platform are little bristles and think of those bristles as something like the ends of your toothbrush they're little little really little bristles and so what you would do with these items to make them have movement is you would take those items and you put them on a table and tap that table. And because of that movement and that vibration, the bears would move. The bear in the middle is on a cart and the three bears that you see on the right are on uh, wooden roly poly discs. So this is how people would show bears and how they would give bears movement at the late 1890s. So Richard saw these and he thought, well, those are great, but I know we can do better. So within the combination of a few items and one of them being many trips to the local zoo where Richard would sketch and look at how these bears or bears would move. So he spent a lot of time observing them in person and, and tracking and, and recalling and trying to see how he could interpret that as a, as a plush toy. So between the drawings, and in 1901, a material called mohair became commercially available. And mohair is made from the wool of a goat. And what's beautiful and magical about this material is that it was, was being able to produce on a commercial scale and it really interpreted well as a, as a covering for toys to give them a soft and realistic feeling. So between wishing to make toys that move his wonderful observations of bears in the zoo and the creation of mohair, what he came up with is, drum roll please, PB55. And here you can see what Richard designed based on his design influences and desires to create a moving soft plush toy bear for children. So this 55 PB or barley is, is, is what you see here. This is the only picture from a catalog uh, except for one other that exists on this item. So this is really an, what, what he looked like. Um, this bear was string jointed. In other words, all the limbs moved and the head moved and they were attached to the body 
with string. And here you can see a replica of what that bear looked like. And the reason it's a replica is that no original ones have been ever found in the Stife archives or in a collection. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But here you can see what PB, uh, 55 PB looked like or looks like as a replica and what he looked like when he was born over 100 years ago. So what are the key features of PB55? So 55 means the size standing in centimeters. And that's about 22 or 23 inches tall. So it's a big, big boy. The P means plush and the B means movable. And that's how they got his name. It's not a very romantic name or a very sexy selling name, but that really wasn't top of mind of Richard's idea at the time. So he was 55 PB. He was made from long reddish brown mohair and he was fully jointed with strings. And his nose is a material called gutta percha, which is kind of like a, uh, a black hard waxy rubber. And that was applied to the nose drop by drop. So he's very heavy and stuffed with excelsior. And he was made to really look like a real bear based on the drawings that Richard had made. Here is a picture of PB55 debuting at the Leipzig Spring Fair. Now this is important. This is where the teddy bear as we know it as created by Stipe debuted in 1903. Leipzig is a town in Germany and pre-war it was known as, its, as the place where the toy fair in the, in the winter and early spring took place that debuted all the great toys that would happen uh, for the rest of the year. And here, if you look in the left-hand side, sort of on the top, you'll see sort of a, a clunky looking dark bear dancing with a clunky looking dark monkey. And that is PB55 on the catalog page of the Leipzig Spring Fair toy catalog made by Steiff. And you can see some other products that the company made as well. Those, those products are a huge lecture in themselves. I'd be happy to talk more, but they are each one I could talk about for hours. So what happened at the Leipzig Spring Fair in 1903? Well, a company called George Borgfeld, who was headquartered here in, in New York, and here you can see his building, which was absolutely enormous at the time, that was filled to the brim with all sorts of interesting products from all over the world. And Borgfeld would would send his representatives all over the world to find the latest and greatest and newest items to sell through his distribution company here in the United States and abroad uh, to bring those exciting products to the whole world. So George Borgfeld sent a representative to that Leipzig Troy Fair and that representative was Herman Berg. Now Herman Berg walked through the Leipzig Toy Fair in 1903 and stumbled across, or so we're told, uh, the Stife booth and ran into the 55 PBs, fell in love with them and ordered a lot of them, which is very exciting. And so technically that is how the teddy bear was introduced to America through Herman Berg and the Borgfeld company, where supposedly they were uh, a shipment of several thousand were sent from the factory in Gingen, Germany to the New York headquarters, um, which is very interesting. What is sort of the giant mystery here is that there is no PB55s ever been seen here in the United States. There's no record of them. We can't find them. We've never seen one. Specialists like myself and others involved in the agency in the industry have never come across a one or really even seen a picture other than the ones provided by the company. So what I did is I'm trying to figure out, well, what happened to PB55? Did he ever really arrive in America? So I took a little side adventure and I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we are practically on the campus of Harvard Business School who has a great library. And so I got access to this business school library where I found a book published by the house of George Borgfeld in 1906, talking about their highlights and their best accomplishments um, over time uh, since the company had founded. This book was self-published in 1906. And here you can see a picture of Herman Berg and the toy, and the toy uh, uh, contents of, of the Borgfeld company. And they talk about here, you don't have to read the whole description here, but what I find so interesting is that in this description of imported toys and how proud they are of this department, no mention of the teddy bear was made. So I've never, I've never been really sure if the teddy bears actually arrived in America, but I do know that PB50, PB55 was the first Stife teddy bear and cataloged many interesting and following bears, which we'll talk about momentarily. 
I just wanted to share this quote with you, which is one of my favorites. This, is, this quote was made by a friend of mine, Mrs. Fustig, who is the official Stark archivist in King and Germany. And in 2011, she, she had an interview with the BBC about the status of PB55. And she says, and I will read to you, when I have guests, I say to them, look in your home to see if there's a strange looking bear in a dark color and send me a photo. And I'm waiting every day, hoping that somebody has found a 55 PB. So that's our big mystery. We'd love to figure that out. I would die a happy person if I could solve that mystery for the Stife community and the world, but who knows if that will happen. So that was Stife's first bear. Let's move on. Of course, the issues with that Stife bear, the PB55, is that he was very heavy, he was very string jointed, and he wasn't very uh, user friendly is a term as we would use today. So Stife came up with the next rendition of bears called 28 PB and 35 PB. And these bears were rod jointed. And here you can see an example of a metal rod jointed bear. And these bears appeared in the line from 1904 through 1905. And because these bears are so early, all the examples I'm gonna share for you, with you in the next few minutes look very different, but they all have a few very similar characteristics. They're all rod jointed. In other words, they have an internal metal skeleton that keeps their joints moving and connected, which is different than the string jointed. And of course you would think with string, if they were very heavy, the strings would break and such. So these were made in a variety of different colors, white blonde, dark blonde, apricot. I've seen these in a number of different colors. They're, and they're fully jointed. Their eyes are always black button and they have these gutta bircha noses again. Um, they have five claws per their pads. And they're very, they're very heavy and they're excelsior stuff, but they're not as bulky as the previous version. So here you can see a wonderful bear. This bear's name is Roddy. I met him personally. He lives um, in the United States on the West Coast, the far West Coast, and he's just a beautiful example. Here are some other rod bears um, that I have handled or have seen personally. The one on the left you can see has these wonderful uh, features and, and presentation. You can see the arms are very long because technically they were designed to be on all fours. And here on the right, you can see another rod bear and you can see a partial um, x-ray of his skeleton. And that's what we mean by metal rod jointing. You can see that going to his head and to his arms. That's what keeps everything moving. And of course, these have the, the very rare elephant button. You can see that here in the middle of the slide. That's how these are branded and the elephant you can see is what is the button in the ear of these items. And what makes this elephant button so special and so endearing is that if you look at the shape of its trunk, it's an S for the shape of the letter for obviously the word stife. And here is a close up of some identification um, detailing that would come with these very early rod bears. There's a close up of that elephant button. And here you can see that S shaped trunk a little more closely. And what you see here on the right is a chest tag that would have gone on one of these early and original rod bears. Extraordinarily, extraordinarily rare. I've only seen just a handful of these in probably 40 or 50 years of loving and collecting and studying Stife. So we'll move on now from those rod bears that were only in the line for a little bit. So let's take a look what a difference a year makes from 1904, the rod bear on the left, to 1905 to a disc jointed bear. And by disc jointing bear, I mean that the arms and legs and head are connected by a, a technology of cardboard round discs and little metal hooks. So that entire metal skeleton of the rod jointed bear has been replaced by a much lighter and a much more compact jointing system, which also allowed the bears to have a much more soft and endearing look. So the bear on the left is a rod jointed bear from 1904 and the bear on the right is a disjointed bear from 1905. Aren't they beautiful? Both I handled both of these pretty much at the same time uh, during some auction work several years ago. So what do you need to know about these 1905 through 1919 disjointed bears? These are just beautiful. And when collectors see these, they, they just smile. These are probably the most, are amongst the most desirable early stife bears. What you're going to see, of course, are these beautiful black eyes, in the early versions, um, by about 1910 or so, you might start seeing glass pupil eyes that would be brown and black glass pupil. They're fully jointed with an embroidered nose and mouth. And what's also sort of a key feature to help dating is that these earliest disc jointed bears had a slightly shaved muzzle 
In other words, the area around the nose and a little bit sort of near the mouth were trimmed a bit. So the, the, the body was fuzzy and the, the muzzle was a little bit, a little bit uh, shorter, nice trim. Um, in 1905, they had five claws per paw. By 1906, they had four um, and they were stuffed with Excelsior and or Excelsior and Kapok to make them lighter. And Kapok is a natural stuffing, sort of like a cotton fluffy material. And that really decreased the weight of these items, which made them far more playful and far less expensive to ship because they weighed a whole, a whole lot less. And a big back hump and long curved arms. And some of them had voices, the side squeaker on the medium ones and the growlers on the larger ones. What's in, important and interesting to note is that through 1933, Stife bears were measured as sitting. After 1933, they're measured as standing. So that's, you have to be very careful when you look at measurements to make sure you're looking at the right, what you're, you're, you're understanding that what the number is corresponding to either sitting or standing. And here's some examples of some wonderful disc jointed original teddy bears, the early ones from 1909 through 1919. And you can see how they differ uh, just because they're all made by hand, different sizes different, manu different uh, seamstresses are making them and they all have a slightly different look, but they all have a wonderful quality to them and a wonderful endearingness and, and appeal to them. And one of the things that's magical about bears from this time is that for the most part, they become more attractive and more appealing and more endearing as they get older. You see the one here, for example, on the far right is for a very early one in a wonderful color he sort of has that wonderful slumpy look and that's something collectors just can't get enough of. Aren't they beautiful? And they're all from that period. So what are the differences between 1905 and 1906? Also a banner year at Stife and things really took off starting in 1906. So in 1905, of course, you had a name called PAB or Barley, five claws per pad and a blank Stife button. In other words, the elephant button had been replaced with a button that had nothing on it. And the article number was somewhat specific. And that is sort of the ID or product number. By 1906, things, these bears were be, were be called teddy bears. And we'll talk a little bit about why that happened. They also went from five claws to four claws and from a blank staff button to a trailing F button. And the article number or the product number, again, was updated, but it was updated in a way that helped to describe the product as opposed to being a little bit more confusing. And these are all elements that, that experts like myself use in order to identify value and date bears that are very early because they have these very subtle differences. So why did things change from 1905 to 1906? So, so what's in a name? In 1905, of course, we had barley or PAB. In 1906, we had the teddy bear. And why is that? Well, what, it, what was happening in the United States is you see this wonderful cartoon here. This, was, this cartoon is called Drawing the Line in Mississippi. It was drawn by Clifford Berryman in 1902 and was published in the Washington Post. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt began, who, who did go often by the name of Teddy, um, he was associated, he, he, began to be, he began to be associated with bears and in turn teddy bears because in this cartoon, he showed great kindness to this little cub who was chained to a tree so he could shoot him in a bear hunt in, Minis in Mississippi. He didn't want to do that. So he, his name sort of became associated with teddies and soft plush bears. And Stife started to use the name Teddy to describe their bears as in teddy bears, as did the rest of the world. And that is why in 1905 through 1906, you'll see this, this name change going from Barley to Teddy after Teddy Roosevelt and drawing the line. And I wanted to share with you this print advertisement from 1913, and it's an early, of course. And here you see this wonderful bear in the middle with all the characteristics that we've described with his long curved arms and his happy face and such. He's holding a, a play ball and surrounded by other Stife friends. Let's jump now to the 1920s and we call these the roaring 20s for good reason. These bears that you see here are all very typical of 1920s Stife production and all are just beautiful and very endearing and beloved by collectors. So one of the things that influenced the design of the Stife teddy bear, besides obviously the culture and climate of the time, was Richard Stife again. Now remember this fellow introduced and designed the teddy bear at the turn of last century. What he had done 
is he had moved to America in 1923 in order to um, help the Stife Company grow here in America. And he was very, very involved in product design and development. And it's just fascinating. He writes in 1925, our teddies in the showroom here in New York appear colorless, sober, and insipid. I feel inclined to decorate all the teddies we have left with huge, colorful silk ribbons. Only then can we ask a slightly higher price. And I think what you're seeing here is that in all, in, for all, in all honesty, Stipe really didn't update and introduce new teddy bear designs or, or change fundamentally the bears they designed at the turn of last century. And Richard Stife in the early 1920s is sensing it is time to move on from these original designs to update them and create a new line that is attractive and endearing and will help the Stife company really gain a leadership role in toy manufacturing globally. So with that framework, let's look at some Teddy trends from 1920. So what you're going to see in the 1920 items I'm going to show you, and another way sort of a char chief characteristics of teddy bears from the 1920s is I call them the three Fs. And I mean, these all totally flattering. They're fuzzy, fat, and feminine. And you'll know exactly what I mean after I share some with you. They're just delightful, they're soft, they're playful and such. They're very rounded. What you're going to see is these bears were designed not only as toys and playthings, but as things for women to carry around as playthings uh, and at, 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 at almost like a little companions, like one would carry a purse, one would carry one of these, these teddy bears in these wonderful colors and soft shapes. Wonderful colors introduced, new materials introduced, lots of detailing, lots of accessories. These are designed as arm candy with lots of novelties um, spinning off of these great designs. Many of the bear patterns are given their given sort of more endearing or childhood childlike names in the 1920s as opposed to just Barley or Teddy or such. And then you're going to start seeing, of course, probably as um, a result of Richard's directive, collars, bells, and other colorful accessories. So let's dive right into the 20s. Here are some traditional teddy bears from the 1920s. And as you can see, the three Fs here on the left in this white bear, she certainly is fuzzy, fat, and feminine. Wonderful fuzzy muzzles. We've gone from a trimmed muzzle to these fuzzy muzzles. And you can see that clearly here on the left, excuse me, on the right. Here's another wonderful bear on the left here, this brown one with this fuzzy muzzle and he's very sort of endearing and kind of just delightful and, and, and very just squeezable. You're gonna see these in all sorts of different colors, these traditional bears, white, brown, blonde, brown, and other rarities, very, there's, they continue to be disjointed and they all have glass pupil eyes. And one of the things that you'll see in the 20s is more of an oversized glass pupil eyes to give them a more childlike look. And, and, and such. These are often stuffed with Excelsior and Kapok to keep them light. And you're going to start to see the back hump, which was so, so prominent through the 20s to become a little less prominent as the bodies fill out and become a little more toddler-esque. Here's some wonderful 1920 through 1929 bears. You can see sort of the wonderful childlike and, and, and colorful glow they have to them. Perhaps one of the first named bears of this decade is called Teddy Rose, and she appeared from 1925 through 1930. And I'm sure you're not surprised, she is named for her delightful color, which is pink. You can't get more fuzzy, fat, and feminine than these wonderful Teddy Rose bears. Here on the left, you can see a pink one, and on the right, a wonderful yellow one. They did come in these colors. And what you need to know about Teddy Rose, they're very, very rare on the secondary market, these original ones, although Stife has produced these as replicas several times over. They have brown embroidered noses and mouths. They're usually uh, stuffed with Excelsior and Kapok to keep them lighter, again, for fully functional reasons, to be more playful, to be arm candy, and to be lighter for shipping. Um, and you'll see this bear, um, just, just absolutely lovely and very feminine. And according to the Stife records, this bear is from 1926, the basis of Teddy Clown, which is another bear we're going to talk about. So Stife would take a bear, it would be very successful in its design, and they would build on it to make another style of bear. This bear from 1926 through 1927 is extraordinarily rare. His name is Happy, and Happy is known for his giant oversized eyes, how childlike, and his brown features and his brown tipped mohair. 
And so he was produced in 11 sizes ranging from 15 to 80 centimeters. And what is most important about him, of course, is the brown tip mohair and his brown nose and mouth. What's fascinating about this design, this happy design, is that in 1989, a happy was purchased at Sotheby's for 50,000 pounds to celebrate a wedding anniversary. So a, a, a private collector in America bought this for his wife for a happy anniversary present. And the bidding was fast and furious at the Sotheby's auction in 1989. And the family finally won through their proxy. And it's very interesting to note that the underbidder for this bear was the British royal family who probably didn't like to lose terribly much. But anyway, that's a wonderful story about happy and this design, the happy bear. We talked a little bit about Teddy Clown and we mentioned how, how, how Teddy Rose was the foundation for Teddy Clown. And clearly you can see here the, diff the similarities in their design. And this Teddy Clown is absolutely beloved by collectors and appeared in the line through 1930, another one of the Roaring Twenty Bears. And so what do you have to know about Teddy Clown? Teddy Clown um, is usually seen in a brown tipped mohair and Teddy Clown always has a felt hat with pom-poms on it and a ruff, that sort of that, that frill around the neck. And he really is a little clown. And one way to tell if the hat on the Teddy Clown is original, because it is possible that someone could put a hat on a bear and see that he's, say that he's a Teddy Clown and perhaps he's not really, is that that hat is stuffed with Excelsior to keep it hard and um, upright and it also has a disc on the bottom of it. And so this is a Teddy Clown and these were produced in five sizes um, over time in pink or yellow mohair or this tipped mohair. And like the other bears of the time were produced uh, with no mohair and kapok to keep them light and playable. And just beautiful, absolutely beloved, beloved Teddy Clowns. Here are some more examples. The picture on the left is from the Poppenhaus Museum where that big pie of miniature teddy bears I showed you at the beginning of the presentation is also from. You can see a number of these wonderful teddy clowns in the tip mohair, and I believe that's a, a yellow one you can see there as well on the left, and the different hat colors and such. And the close-up of the one here on the right, you can see the beautiful ruffle and the hat and the absolutely beautiful and endearing expression. His tipping has faded a little bit over time, and you do see that. By tipping, I mean it's just on the ends of the mohair material would be a darker brown and the, 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 the base or the shaft would be a lighter color, but sometimes that brown fades over time and that's fine. A really quick look in 1927, this is how this bear was presented in the marketing materials. And he's walking on top of the world and you can see his beautiful tipped mohair, prominent hat and ruff. Stife loved this model and the world loved it right back. In 1928 through 1930, Another bear came out, a very distinctive bear that Stipe is known for and is often replicated because he is so beloved. This is called Petsy the baby bear. And Petsy is known uh, primarily for his also has tipped mohair. But tip, Petsy has a number of features that make him very childlike. And if you look at the picture here on the right, you can see that he has very large ears. They're lined in wire and are poseable. And they're sort of exaggerated like you'd see on a small child. They're placed low on his head. He has what's called a center seam across his face. In other words, there is a no, there is a, a, a seam that goes from his nose back to his forehead in a straight line. And that is also to show how symmetrical and parallel his face is, making him very youthful. Giant oversized eyes in the tipped version in blue and black pupil, and also low on the face. And these are all sort of design tricks that make something look very sweet very endearing and very young. And that's why many people look at this bear and go, ooh and ah, what a sweet baby. And that's exactly what Stife wanted. And here you can see an example on the left. For the most part, the tipped brown petsies have a sort of a pinkish nose and pinkish embroidery and a wonderful, really youthful look. This was a very popular model. People just loved him for good reason. Everybody I know loves the one, would want one. They're very aspirational for collectors. They're extremely rare and very expensive. This design was so popular, it was designed as a puppet, purse, a music box, and a pull toy, in addition to this wonderful 
standalone teddy bear. And you could see again here, fluffy, fat, feminine, very youthful, and really very reflective of the times. Isn't she beautiful? I certainly think so. So this is a Petsy that I encountered. Um, I was doing an appraisal at uh, an estate here on the East Coast. And I walked into the room and this giant Petsy was sitting in a chair and waiting for me. And I have to tell you, this was one of the happiest moments of my appraiser life was to look at this magnificent bear in wonderful condition and just appreciate the beauty, the craftsmanship, the detailing that makes this bear so extraordinary in so many ways and so appealing to collectors. And perhaps you're feeling the same way as you look at him and your heart is warming as mine is. Here are a few more Petsies that I've handled or have written about. The one on the left has its wonderful brown tipping, very prominent still. And what this one has that a few of the models did have are these wonderful eyes. They're black and blue and they're almost, uh, they're like a slit pupil, uh, half and half per se. And these would be able to be twisted and turned to give your Petsy all sorts of different facial expressions. So imagine those eyes crossed or imagine those eyes looking up or looking to the side. Uh, it's amazing what eyes can do to give a different expression to a bear. And what Stipe was doing with this particular Petsy model and others like it, were giving a very playful factor and feature to this bear so people would love it, engage with it, and the bear would be interactive and just become part of one's family and one's love, which is absolutely what would happen. This bear here on the right, a little more threadbare and no pun intended, but I put her here because I wanted you to see the prominent seam that goes from her forehead to her nose. And again, that seam is called a center seam, very rare, very endearing, and gives the, and really emphasizes how parallel and symmetrical the head and the face are giving it a really babyish look. Isn't she beautiful? Here is Petsy's marketing. Now I thought it was always very strange. I've studied Stife's ephemera and marketing as closely as I have studied Stife's products. I really can't find an advertisement or anything specifically advertising Petsy. And you can see here in 1929, I call it this Petsy marketing sort of, because you can see her here on the bottom but uh, she's not the main player in this catalog page. And I wondered why, because she's so beautiful and so endearing. But Stife really never marketed her with the emphasis that they did with Teddy Clown and other items. Next up, in 1929 through 1943, Stife came out with something called Teddy Baby. And Teddy Baby is a really interesting design because not only was it produced pre-war, it was also produced post-war. And we'll talk about that later in the lecture. But let's talk a little bit now about the pre-war teddy babies. And you can see how beautiful they are. And they have a wonderful, wonderful smile. At least many of them do. So what do you have to know about teddy babies? Well, they were in the line for a really long time. And they are collector's favorites to this day. They were produced in mohair, which we've talked about, which is that uh, goat's wool. And they were also produced with wool plush bodies. And wool plush is a material that is demonstrated here on the bear on the left. It's a little nubbier. It doesn't have that sort of, uh, sort of carpety feel or, or hooked wood, wool feel that uh, mohair does. It's a smoother uh, finish. It doesn't, it doesn't move around that much when you, when you touch it or run your hands over it, but it has a very lovely old fashioned and richness to it. Wool plush was used as we get closer and closer to World War II um, because mohair became very expensive and not available for toy making while wool plush was. So wool plush is one of those materials that indicate to appraisers and specialists and collective collectors that the teddy bears were made around a little bit before or a little bit after World War II. These were made in, the teddy babies were made in a huge variety of colors, white, brown, pink, yellow. I've seen them in blue and maize, which is sort of a, a corn orange color. They were made both open and closed mouths, although the closed mouths are much rarer. Um, the little tiny ones are always closed mouths, but the bigger ones could be open or closed mouths. And again, the closed mouths, bigger ones are very rare. They have the brown and black eyes and downturned paws, very childlike. Their flat feet were lined in cardboard and made for standing. And one of the ways you can tell if a collar is original on a teddy baby, and they all came with collars, is that the dark bears came with red collars and bells, and the light bears, or the blonde ones, with blue collars. So you can always check on the collar for authenticity. And like Petsy, 
Teddy Baby was really popular and was made in a series of novelties, including puppets, pajama bags, a Teddy Baby doll, which is adorable and fully dressed, a roly poly, which means it rolls around like a giant weevil. Weevils wobble, but they don't fall down. And that was the sort of a, a, a Teddy Baby head on a big ball and a pull toy. Here are some wonderful pre-war teddy babies. Here on the left is the rare closed one, closed mouth one. He looks a little pouty or maybe hungry or cranky. I'm not sure, but still wonderful and beloved. The one in the middle is was brown. He's faded a bit. You see that sometimes to sort of a silvery tip. And the one here on the right, very classic teddy baby. She's blonde. You can see her chest tag and her bell and her beautiful open smile with wonderful coloring in her mouth. Just delightful. Here's some marketing for teddy babies. And of course, unlike the, the, uh, the, the Petsy, teddy baby was very heavily marketed and absolutely beloved. Here is an advertisement for what looks like wool plush ones that with closed mouths. Wonderful, from 1929. So let's move on to the next decade, the 1930s to the early 1940s. And this is just coming up to World War II. So with that framework in mind, let's look at a number of trends that are happening with Stipe's production at this time. For the most part, very few new patterns were introduced. The 20s, which we just went over with, with Teddy Rose and Teddy Clown and Petsy and that, that whole wonderful menagerie, that really was a product of the 20s. You're not going to see that in the 30s. Very few patterns are introduced. There are a few and we'll go over them, but nothing like in the past. The traditional patterns are lean and pensive. And I'll show you what I mean by that. One of the ways that you can sort of tell a bear from the 30s and early 40s is he looks a little thin and grumpy. And I probably would too if I was living in the 30s and the 40s in Germany. So it's really reflective of what's going on. You'll see a greater use of alternative and substitute fabrics. We talked a little bit about the wool plush substituting for mohair. And you'll also going to see something called artificial silk plush which is a, a shiny material that looks great for about 30 seconds and then wears out and looks terrible. But you see a lot of artificial silk plush in the 30s to the early 40s on Stife's traditional products, including their teddy bears. You're going to see a general austerity throughout the production. In other words, anything Stife could do to take steps out of production, take manufacturing out of, out of the, 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 the amount of time it took it to produce an item, if anything Stife could do to use a more inexpensive fabric or anything they could do to save money on a product, you will see happening in the 30s and the early 40s as Stife is trying desperately to stay afloat and use the resources that they have um, as, as effectively as possible in a very trying time. And you'll also see far less playful and colorful lines in, 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 in during this time. And you'll, you will see that clearly as we talk about what we are really seeing um, during this time. So in the 1930s to 1943, obviously Stife was continuing to make traditional teddy bears. And this is what I mean. Although I love each of these fellows and I would welcome them all into my collection, they just don't have the roundness and the appeal and the happiness and the fullness of the bears that you have seen um, in the prior decade. Wouldn't you agree? So what are we seeing here? We're seeing the bears, they are um, fully disjointed um, and they are becoming a little rounder and a little softer and a little simpler. They're just beautiful nonetheless, a continuation of what we've seen in the past. And here are some more, a little more serious, you can see. And in several different colors. And again, still very popular, still very beloved but really becoming a little more, more austere, a little more simple, and a little bit more grumpy. Here you can see a catalog page from 1938 and 1939, where you can see the bears that we've been talking about, the austere bears, and the teddy baby, of course, on the bottom. These were very, very popular bears and uh, really to this day still are. A great product introduction in 1930 through 1941 was called Dicky. Now it is my best guess, although I have no proof about it, that Dicky was named after Richard Stipe. And Richard Stipe passed away in the late 1930s. Uh, so he was still around when Dicky was designed. And I, I'm guessing that it, Stipe may have named him in a tribute to their wonderful, uh, really great grandfather who invented anything that Stipe had built on um, from its start. 
So I'm, I'm thinking that he might be named after Richard Stipe. And Dickey really was designed to be as efficient as, as possible with materials. So he is he was called um, sort of the, the efficiency model or the or a, a an inexpensive model because the number of seams that he has and his design and his presentation um, have really had all excess all excess squeezed out of him. Now he's still incredibly appealing and he's still very charming. Um, he's he does have a serious and sort of narrow look, which is appropriate to the time. And one of the things that Dickey is very well known for is his mouth, which has painting on it. You can see that a little bit better with the one on the right, as well as his paw pads, which are made out of velvet, which is most interesting because velvet is far less expensive than felt. So that's one indication of, of somewhat wartime production. But these velvet pads were airbrushed with claws and, and sort of foot hands and feet on them. So they're very appealing. So it's Stife really got a great bang for their buck using velvet painted paw pads on this dicky bear from this time where efficiency really counted. And so again, what are you going to see with the dickies? They're made out of mohair or wool plush, like you would expect from bears from this time, with the felt, but more likely velvet pads, which could be airbrushed inexpensively. The muzzle, which is made out of a, a, an inexpensive shorter mohair, and facial airbrushing, and, and, the, and of course, the feet. Just a beautiful bear, but very period to the time. Dickey came in a, a couple of variations. Um, very infrequently, you will see a Dickey with plain felt paws. Those paw pads are not replaced, um, at least on the feet, on the example here on the left. They did come in plain felt. And he also came in a very high-end called model called a snap dickey, where his hands and feet and body snapped with metal jointing. He could hold things in his in his paws and in his feet. And it's a very interesting bear. Very few were made. And when these come to auction, they can easily sell um, in, in the five figures, just absolutely rare and absolutely beautiful. The early 1940s through 1948, as you can imagine, not the very best time at Steiff or in Germany, and I have a three-hour lecture on what exactly happened during this period, which I can't go into now because we are um, very limited with time and I have to keep on point with teddy bears, but this is a very interesting time and um, not a lot happened. One thing I can tell you is that the earliest post-war production teddy bear that I could come across is this bear right here. And this is really a teddy baby doll, which is fascinating. Her head is made out of artificial silk plush, which is very period to wartime production. Her body is made out of like a stockinette or a rayon material. That's like a heavy women's stocking. And the tips of her hands and her feet are made from um, artificial silk plush. And these bears were made, I think probably I would say as early as maybe 1946. And these were one of the very first items that were available for purchase exclusively for the US soldiers on the PX bases in Germany. And I have an oral history of a woman who recalls as a two-year-old going to the PX and picking one of these out immediately after World War II. So that is how I think all of this comes together. But what you see here is Steiff working with the absolute minimal materials, very inexpensive materials, very wartime materials, desperately trying to produce beautiful toys for children, beautiful teddy bears for children. And these are extraordinary ephemeral. If you find one, um, it's very unusual for them to be in good shape because they would, you know, the materials themselves are so, uh, are so fragile, but they are a beautiful and elegant tribute to Stife's toy production immediately after World War. Too. And there is no report of these in any Stife catalog because I don't think Stife is cataloging anything or anything publicly available at the time. So let's jump to the 50s and lots of fun things happen. So what you're going to see in the late 1940s through 1959 is that traditional teddy bears and teddy babies are produced in the pre-war designs and proportions, but often in substitute fabrics. These were very popular before the war and continued so after the war. The traditional teddy bear model was updated in 1950 to reflect the new market realities and renamed original teddy. The bear became much fatter and much more uh, friendly and much uh, just very sort of appealing in a robust way. We have new patterns introduced as Steiff tries to re-engage with the world as a premier toy manufacturer. 
anniversary teddy bear patterns um, are introduced and we'll talk a little bit about that. And the line again is joyful and optimistic. Now I'm not gonna say it's, it's fat, feminine and fluffy, but it's certainly very happy. It's very um, interesting, it's very engaging and it's reflective of the optimism of the mid-century. We see in the very early, uh, very late 1940s, early 1950s, alternative materials still in use. In 1948, here on the left, you can see a teddy bear made out of artificial silk plush. And he uh, is, is, has wonderful um, linen pads. And you see linen pads on items also from this time when felt was not available. And this very unusual cotton plush teddy baby, you can see his sort of rough material. It's, a, it's almost like a, a washcloth type of material or a, a sort of an old, so some old fabric, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's not terribly pleasant, but it's very durable. Original teddies we talked about, these were renamed um, and relaunched and re, uh, redesigned in the early 1950s. And you see these much shorter arms and the very round face, prominent noses, very sweet, very appealing, many different colors. And here you can see wonderful ones. The little ones are also very popular at the time. Um, Stipe had a giant emphasis on creating little products, little bears, little and lots of lots of little pets like dogs and cats and and farm animals in the early 1950s because these were wonderful uh, things for people to take back to their countries after World War II. Soldiers could put these easily in their pockets and in their and their in their trunks and such and bring them back home. They're wonderful souvenirs and they were also easy to pack and distribute. These were made in a number of different colors, again, fully jointed with embroidery um, and delightful eyes and such. Wonderful original teddies from the 1950s to the 1966. And you can see that happy look, bigger paws, shorter, the sort of big floppy paws, shorter arms and, and really a happy 50s look. 1951, Stipe introduced probably its most prolific bear post-war, its Zotti bear. And I would say maybe 30% of things I'm asked to appraise are these Zotti bears. They are so beloved and so um, everywhere in the market. They were produced for many years in many different sizes. And uh, this, is, this is a very popular bear of the, the right after mid-century onward. And so what, what is a zotti? Zotti is, a, the word itself comes from the, the German word zottel, meaning fuzzy. For the most part, these also have downturned pads, uh, excuse me, downturned arms. They have open mouths lined in felt and an orange bib and big happy eyes. And it's not uncommon because these are so common and people love them and use them as toys that the mouths are often very dirty because children try to feed them. Because look at that big happy mouth. Wouldn't you want to put some of your oatmeal in there as well? Anyway, so we spend a lot of time cleaning Azadi's mouths and, um, and loving them and fluffing them. Just a beautiful bear made in nine sizes up to a hundred centimeters. Very toddler-esque. Also an anniversary bear, 1953, Jackie Bears came out. And this was an entirely new design like the Zotti, being an entirely new design for Stipe. And here you can see Jackie and she came in three sizes, which you can see here on the left, a small, a medium, and a large. And what you have to know about Jackie is basically she has a delightful pink stripe across her nose and a very prominent airbrushed belly button. She's very stocky. She's a very sweet, very rounded bear. Um, she's, she also is known for her pink ribbon. She's very plump. She was produced in honor of the 50th anniversary of the teddy bear, which came out in 1903. I've always thought that Jackie was named possibly after Jackie O. This has never been confirmed, but the timelines overlap and they're both beautiful, youthful and introduce and really suggest wonderful things on the horizon. So I would not be surprised if Jackie was a nod to Jackie Onassis and her wonderful influence in the early 1950s. And here are some more Jackie bears. The one on the left, just a darling, very toddler-esque. The one here in the middle is everyone in the collecting world has something called the one that got away. And that is something you wanted to buy, but that you didn't for some stupid reason. And then you kick yourself for the next 20 years. This is my, the one that got away. This is a brown Jackie that never went into production. Um, she sold for $2,000 at auction in 2010. And I just watched and waved as she was sold and thought, 
I don't need her, but I still think about her probably daily. Anyway, a wonderful Jackie Bear. And every Jackie came with an original booklet accompanying her. And this was either produced in German or English, depending on where the bear was sold, explaining the history of the Stipe Company and why the 50 year anniversary was so important. And to find a Jackie with all IDs, including her special chest tag and her, her anniversary book is extraordinarily rare and really an such an exciting find for collectors universally. Let's jump to the 60s. The original Teddy that we've been talking about has been redesigned in something called the Mask Teddy. And I'll show you why in just a moment. They are produced in huge quantities. And I would say 50% of the teddy bears I look at are Mask Teddies because they are so common and were produced for so long in so many sizes. There was much theme and variation based on the company's successful Zotti pattern, but relatively no, no innovation. You're not gonna see a lot of new teddy bears produced in the 1960s or new designs. And the emphasis is on toys and playthings, often created in synthetic fabrics as playthings for children. So sort of the collectible market is, is shifted to more of the toy market. Here's the mask teddies I was telling you about. And if you look at the pictures here, you can see why. They sort of have a, a, a around the facial area and the muzzle, what looks like a mask surrounding the eyes and the muzzle. And these were made in 10 sizes up to 100 centimeters from 1966 through 1993 in a number of different colors, white, blonde, caramel, or brown. The earlier ones, and this is one way we date them, are made out of felt, have felt pads, and the later ones have velour pads. And just very distinctive, very lovely. And these look beautiful, posed with dolls. The small ones are called bendies because their arms and legs are on wires and not jointed. And those are very sweet and fit in the hand of a, of a kindergartner, just wonderfully, you often, you often would see these uh, given to children to take to school with them or put in their backpacks as little companions. Wonderful. Here are the mask teddies. You can see that prominent mask. Here on the upper left is the bendies I was telling you about. And so those arms and legs are not jointed. The heads are in most cases, and they do bend and fit nicely in one's hand. Just beautiful. In 1960 through 1961, um, the popularity of the Zotti was still sky high. So Stipe said, let's see if we can do something about that. Let's make them in white. And what you see here are white Zotties. And unlike the caramel tipped Zotties, the white ones are extraordinarily rare. We're only made for, uh, from 1960 through 1961 and just a handful of, of, of production. So they're very, very rare. And here you can see the smaller one and the larger one. And they have the same similar designs, the downturn paws, the happy open mouths and the peach chest, but these are all in white and just beautiful. Very rare, very, very rare. The 1970s, what's going on? The mask Teddy and Zotti still hugely popular. And this would be the brown tipped Zotti, not the white one that, did, that didn't do so well at the time. The new items are designed to be very streamlined in design and the materials are very efficient. And the emphasis really is on toys, goofy, playful toys that are softly stuffed, often washable, um, made from synthetic fabrics and with cartoon style eyes. So that's another way that appraisers like myself look at things and say, you know, what are the general characteristics? If something is soft and goofy made out of artificial materials, chances are it was made probably in the seventies. Here's one of the, the only teddy bear debuts of the seventies from 1970 through 1976. Stife made a Draylon Teddy Petsy which of course is probably a nod to the earlier Petsy we talked about from the 20s, but he doesn't really have the appeal. People say he looks like a little Winnie the Pooh and that's, that's really true. He's fully jointed. He's made out of Draylon and Draylon was a material that was very big in the 70s. It's an artificial material. It's built for tough. You can't, the stuff doesn't rip or break or, or bruise or anything and it's washable. You can scrub it. So it really was a very good material for children's toys, very durable. And here's a close up of that Draylon Petsy. He was made in beige, gold, or caramel. He had velour pads and he looks like Winnie the Pooh. Very 1970s. I'm sure you can sort of recognize that look and such. So we're zooming ahead to the 90s, the 80s and the 90s. And what I like to say about this period is what, old, what is old is new again. Stipe did very little in terms of product design for teddy bears, but started to look back on successful designs and successful trends to create replicas and edition products. So special editions and replicas became very, very popular during this time. Christmas ornaments and Christmas items became a very important category for Stipe. They were not so 
until about the 1980s. Stipe made a Santa Claus starting in the 1950s, but they never really did anything for um, really Christmas per se until the 80s when the whole lines would come out uh, for, this, for that time of the year, including ornaments, centerpieces, and decorations. Um, we started, Stife started to do a lot of work with Disney with the first Epcot Doll and Teddy Bear Weekend in 1988. And that was sort of an, a, a barrage of events partnering with Disney and other premier organizations and creating special teddy bear products, limited edition for those events. We also, Stife also started a number of North American partnerships with other toy manufacturers like Suzanne Gibson and other retailers like FAO Schwartz that really that really took hold and doing all sorts of partnerships. For instance, producing a, a partnership with Barbie and doing a Barbie doll with a Stife product next to it. So we would do, Stife did a number of collaborations with other popular manufacturers starting in the 80s and 90s. And they also started the Stife Club in the early 1990s. So Stife was really trying to focus on marketing collaborations, partnerships, and um, creating special um, senses of urgency to buy products by producing them in limited editions. And here you can see some of those highlights from the 80s, the teddy bears that I've pulled out. The Margaret Strong editions from the 80s and 90s were very popular and based on a series of teddy bears found at the Margaret Strong Museum in Rochester, New York. Uh, all sorts of museum collections, in other words, reproducing items that have, were seen in a museum, the Stife Museum or other toy museums that were very popular. People could not really afford these types of antiques or they were not available, but the replicas certainly were. Here on the bottom, you can see a Suzanne Gibson with the uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. The Stife Club Edition, this gold and um, pink teddy bear, very popular in the 90s from the Stife Club. And of course, this Donald Mickey was one of the most beloved collaborations with the Disney Epcot weekend. Um, that's a Donald Duck teddy bear. I know that doesn't make sense, but it, it actually works in this case. And it's, so it's a Donald Duck with teddy bear ears and teddy bear feet, but he has wearing like yellow felt duck shoe clogs. Very cute. I've seen this in person. It actually works really well, but it's, uh, it's very funky and very reflective of the period. So what's happening now, the 21st century? I like to say Stife and the teddy bear world is building on legacy. Licensing is really key. So from, for the, many of the teddy bears that you see are licensed products um, and are in collaboration with famous authors, uh, books, um, movies, television, anything to do with a teddy bear that can be produced by Stife um, is, is very much in demand um, in, now and, 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 and probably moving forward. Stife has also been partnering with other luxury brands like Swarovski and Laudro to produce very high-end uh, luxury bears. They just recently came out with a collaboration with Tiffany, where it's a darling mohair bear with the Tiffany blue pads, which is really a wonderful combination. And I believe he has some sort of sterling jewelry as well. So that's a, sort of the best of all worlds. So these very expensive products are, are very key in terms of Teddy trends today. Um, Stipe is spending a lot of time looking back at the teddy bear world for creations and, and, and inspirations. Here you can see on the left what I mean by that. It's a wonderful replica of a, of a, of a Petsy from the late 1920s, just beautiful. Stipe also uses unconventional or um, new materials for teddy bears um, as part of their design to keep things sort of modern and upbeat. The addition sizes, which used to be in the thousands are now in the hundreds because it is more exclusive and creating a more sense of urgency to purchase items. Um, Halloween and Easter have become really big um, in addition to Christmas in terms of producing lots of rabbits or special Halloween um, editions, you know, scary black cats and, and bears wearing witches outfits and such. Very, um, very seasonal has become very important. And Stife has also started to produce what's called teddy bear workshops where the company um, over time has has sent their teddy bear making team on the road to work with collectors all over the globe really to personalize and create their own Stife teddy bears in their own hands, which is a wonderful way to share that the, the quality and the integrity and how much work it really is to make a teddy bear, to, 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 to bring it to life and decorate it and make it personal is an extraordinary experience. I have done it twice. And I think each, each class is, is four or five hours. It's just an amazing experience and that's really you know, bringing that experience to life and hopefully 
post COVID that can, that can happen again. So let's look at some of the bears that are really um, from, from the 21st century and, and what makes them so interesting and special. You'll see on the top left, an Alfonso bear. This is a replica of a bear from the turn of last century who belonged to a Russian princess. The bear in the middle with the, the, the big eyes and the gold pendant, his mohair is actually flecked with real 14 karat gold and he has gold um, accessories and jewelry. And he's an example of the high end. Um, on the bottom, you can see the bear on the left, on the bottom as wearing a Swarovski a pendant and a Swarovski crystal button and ear. And the middle one is a Yadro, um, just wonderful. And the bear on the bottom in the, in the flying suit is a special we made, Stif made special bear for Boeing. And it's a wonderful bear and designed after the, the man who invented or, or started the company. So a lot of, lot of these bears, very high-end, very personal, very co-branded, very, um, very high-end with great stories and great legacies. And that's what's happening today. So that's the teddy bear world. I know that was a lot to take in. It's a lot to deliver too. But anyway, as I end all talks, thank you for your time. Teddy hugs. This is not me. I wish it were. Um, I so enjoyed speaking with you. I hope you are in love with Stipe or more in love with Stipe than you were when we started. And this is me. Um, that is not a teddy bear, that's a giant monkey. That is life-size, it is indeed. Um, I welcome your inquiries. Do all things button and ear. I will do my best to respond in a timely manner. Drop me an email at stiflife at gmail.com if I can be helpful in any way. And if you are interested in learning more about Stife, please learn about, visit, and admire Stife goodies at my website, which is www.mystifelife.com. We have world-class shopping, educational resources and eye candy. Wonderful. As always, it takes a village to make a presentation, uh, to do anything really these days. These are these wonderful resources, books, people, auction houses, and organizations that help make this possible. So that's what I have for you. Let me put this back and I'm gonna stop my sharing and I'm gonna send it back to you was wonderful. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions here. Certainly. Bring them on. So the first one uh, kind of takes us back. Uh, so Margaret Steiff won a Grand Prix award at the 1904 World's Fair here in St. Louis. Yes. Where the field house is based. So the question is, would that have been one of the rod fairs or one of the disc, fair, disc fairs that would have been at the fair? That would have been a disc bear. And let me tell you something that's fascinating about that World's Fair. So one of the things the Stife brothers, the Stife nephews went to that World's Fair to be, to a, to be at that trade show booth. And one of the brothers, the, excuse me, the nephews, noticed that the animals in the animal livestock competition all were wearing tags with buttons in their ears. And he thought, what a wonderful idea. And he brought that back to Germany. And that is the reason for your wonderful town gave the Stife nephews the idea for the button in ear branding based on that World's Fair attendance. Wow, I hadn't heard that part of the story before. But... Yes, absolutely. No, that, yeah, and again, that, that, would have, that would have been uh, the, 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 um, the rod bears. Or maybe the, I, it, it just depends really what, what they had in inventory. And in 1904, you were, you were starting to see the disc bears. Uh, another question is that, I don't know if you would actually know this one. Remember that Mr. Rogers puppets were stiff. I think they were. I remember the, 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 um, the, the tiger for sure and the rabbit for sure. Oh, here's a good one. How would you recommend cleaning uh, some of the bears? So like okay. older ones versus the newer ones. Absolutely. So you have to be really, really careful. And what I can do is I, I, have, I have done a whole video on how to clean because it's really an art, not a science. For anything that's really pre-war, it would be my very best recommendation, not if you are a novice, not to clean them because old 
early mohair can dry out. And when it gets wet, it can literally disintegrate in your hands. So I would be very hesitant to recommend cleaning pre-war items unless you you have you are you are confident that the mohair has structural integrity and is um, um, you know not going to fall apart. Given mohair is 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 healthy and is robust and is not it is is not oxidized or or changed over time, the way I clean is I take about a cup or cup and a half of warm water, a spritz of OxyClean, a drop or two of um, Woolite. I mix that up and very, very, very lightly moisten a white cloth, like a washcloth and, and clean the bear very, very carefully. I always start in a small private part in the back that just in case there's a problem, you know, you're not gonna. It, 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 you're just sort of testing it out in the in, in in a in a small inconspicuous space. It it usually is fine. Again, if you have any doubts that the fabric is delicate or any any doubts that the fabric might uh, have problems getting wet, I would not do it and send it to a professional. But again, this is assuming the fabric is healthy and and and, and with integrity. You can very lightly clean with this with this with this mixture of of warm water, OxyClean. And um, and wool light and that because because mohair is is a woolen material, the the oxyclean and the wool light is is a really nice gentle very very dilute solution, really can help clean things very easily and very well. I can send you the link to the cleaning video if you want to post that with this video to to give people um, sort of watch me clean something so they can they can clean in tandem or 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 try it on their own things. Does that help? Yeah, that, that link would be great. Um, we have another question here. Do you know why so many of their animals have been named Molly? Yes, that's a great question. And that, thank you for asking that. So Molly debuted as the dog in 1925 and Stife was looking to create, and, and if you think of the time that we talked about in the, the mid 1920s, Stife was really looking to create these fluffy fat and feminine items. They created this dog named Molly, and Molly was actually modeled on a competitor's uh, dog that they had seen that was very popular. And they thought, "We love that, but we can do better." So they created Molly based on um, a, a, a popular dog of another competitor at the time. And the reason they used the word Molly is that in I, I suspect it's sort of a, a German cultural thing. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but Molly sort of implies soft and feminine and charming and lovely. So it so when something is named Molly, it's really meant to be soft and loving and like a plaything. So you'll you will see like Molly bears, you'll see, you know, Molly dogs, you'll see, you know, all sorts of Molly. Um, and it, it's just meant to imply soft and playful and loving and beautiful. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's really interesting. So I think that's about it that we have on our questions right now. And if anyone has any further questions, they can just email you, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Another uh, comment came in, but not a question. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been- Did really you learn something? I did. You love Stife more than ever? I do, I wish I could afford more of it. <laughs> oh, well. well, I was my- pleasure to talk. I hope, I hope, you know, I, I tend to be a stife geek. I could be very granular, but uh, I'm hoping that, that uh, everybody picked up enough to be able, just enough, just enough to be dangerous, as they say. <laughs> I'm sure they did. And if anyone wants to see Stife Everlasting, the exhibit that's on display at the Fieldhouse Museum, we are open Wednesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And on Sundays from noon to four, we are practicing the COVID, social distancing, and we're wearing face masks. We have sanit sanitizing stations set up all around. Um, so you can either come in or uh, we also offer uh, video tours. Um, normally that's for the historic house, but if you want to see the staff exhibit, I'm sure uh, I, can, I can work something out for, for people. <laughs> I wish I could come see you. Yeah, if, if you want, we can, I can set up a video tour of the museum. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think that is all that we have. 
And I'll make sure to get the link for that video posted up here in the comments. And yeah. Well, thank you. And as we say around here, Teddy Hogs, thank you so much for joining me and thank you for your interest in Stife. Thank you. Okay.